Today's video is brought to you by Audible. Audible provides a great value way to access audiobooks for its members and is one of the best ways to make huge savings on Warhammer audiobooks, which is why I personally use and recommend it. Whether you're painting miniatures or doing other daily tasks during the holiday season, Audible provides a great way to optimize your 40k shortlist. As an Audible Premium member, you receive one credit every month for use on any title, and the best way to get value from Audible is in using your credits on those premium audiobooks, often over 10 hours in length. For shorter narratives like First Lord of the Imperium, you may want to consider purchasing this through Audible because premium members also get a 30% discount on audiobooks and it's my preferred option for those shorter stories. A great many of you in my audience are already using Audible, but if you're yet to trial it, you can start today and get full access to thousands of audiobooks, originals, and podcasts, additionally included in the Plus catalogue. But even better though, right now, for a limited time, you'll save 46% on your first four months of Audible. It's an ideal season to get listening and learn more by going to audible.com slash Lutin, or for those in the US, text Lutin to 500-500. Details on the trilogy selection which runs to the end of this year follow at the end of the video. As the horror of Inquisitor Crippman's scheme came further to light, we have begun to finally learn the details of just how the Imperium has decided to deal with the crisis which threatens to unleash either a Tyranid assault far worse than the original tendrils of Leviathan, or an Orc War, the likes of which has never been seen. Neither option is acceptable to the Imperium, and so it now seeks to contain the crisis. Unable to resolve the situation, it is accepted that containment for now is one of its best options, and so they have sought to form a containment circle around the sector of Octorius itself, using the vast resources of the Imperium to do so. After the ousting of Inquisitor Crippman, the new member of the Inquisition primarily handling the situation of Octarius is known as Nasir Sahansan. To no surprise, an outspoken member of the Ordo Xenos, highly critical of Inquisitor Crippman. It's often questioned also how ordinary humans who are non-Astartes are able to cope with the challenge of dealing with conflicts that are of the scale of Octarius in terms of pure lifespan. How is it that Inquisitors are able to travel the galaxy and learn enough to be able to deal with the problems facing the Imperium? Especially when your average human life, even in the age of the Imperium, is only going to be something like a standard century, perhaps a little beyond. So how is it that Inquisitors and the like are capable of handling grinding conflicts that span centuries, perhaps even millennia? Well, for one thing, officials within powerful factions such as the Ecclesiarchy, Inquisition Administratum, and very obviously the Mechanicus, have rejuvenation treatments, lifespan-extending technology available to them that are not available to your standard Imperial governors and other sundry officials. Of course, for the most part, there's always backdoor methods by which people can access this and pay for it. Then of course you also have other methods like bionic augmentation, thus enabling them to engage and manage assignments that would ordinarily only have been perhaps in the initial stages of operation before they themselves expired from the ravages of time. Inquisitor Sahan Sun is one such individual. Despite their reputation for vocally calling out Inquisitor Crippman, who we recall despite his extreme methods, continues by many to be attributed with saving the Imperium, albeit using something akin to a scorched galaxy methodology wielding the power of exterminatus as readily as a guardsman might throw frag grenades, Inquisitor Nasir was equally capable and had achieved many great successes even within his early years of serving the Inquisition. His proactive and aggressive methods though would leave him severely wounded and as such only able in later life to study warfare strategy, of course specifically related to the extermination of Xenos threats to the Imperium. Critically, it would be this, in combination with the respect built in his formative years, that would enable him the associations and connections necessary to formulate a grand strategy, 
in dealing with the Octarius sector. He would reach out to leading admirals of the Imperial Navy, even Astartes' captains, to petition his so-called Cordon Impenetra, the circle of Imperial might surrounding now Octarius, so that if it could not be cleansed, it might at least be contained. His plan was not without considerable criticism from within the Imperium. Many officials claimed his plan was, in fact, on par with Inquisitor Cryptman, for while this suggested impenetrable barrier surrounding Octarius would protect all of those in the wider Imperium, Nasir's Cordon also condemned all worlds within subsectors inside of the Octarius sector to be doomed to weather the insatiable alien festival of slaughter alone. And while it were true that the majority of the Octarius Sector had already been controlled by the Orcs, there remained many Imperial worlds within subsectors on the borders that would now be abandoned to their inevitably grisly fates. Essentially, the calculation that Nasir had made was to write off all worlds either in the process of being assaulted by Xenos or that would soon surely fall, thereby minimising wastage of resources that would be ploughed into worlds already considered lost. Unfortunately, it was accurate to make the comparison with Inquisitor Crippman that in doing so, no effort would be made to evacuate the worlds within the systems of these subsectors. Perhaps most offensively though, while these civilian populations were not to be evacuated, Military forces and hardware, key personnel, treasured artifacts and imperial records were all ordered to be extracted from these worlds, leaving behind only the vulnerable human population. Some officials of course would bribe or escape having caught a sense of what was occurring. Meanwhile, the remaining worlds in systems on the edge of the Imperial Cordon in Penetra would be redesignated as Warden Planets, not dissimilarly to the status of the fabled world of Cadia. They would act now just as Cadia had done before its fall, by becoming heavily fortified and maintaining continual patrols and raids to surgically strike and deal damage to either of the Xenos amid their endless war of attrition, to prevent whichever side was becoming more dominant from securing too strong of a foothold to potentially overcome their entangled enemy or break out from the Octarius sector itself. Breakouts specifically were difficult to prevent and even detect. When attempting to control an area of space as vast as the Octarius sector and all subsectors and systems within, communication issues being as fragmented as they are within the Imperium, coupled with the Tyranid's shadow in the warp blanketing large areas of space, has made detection incredibly challenging. In fact, one horrifying positive in allowing many remaining Imperial worlds within the Cordon to remain is that it has to some degree allowed the ability to monitor where and when Xenos are pushing to break out. The transition for many of these newly designated Warden planets often came at significant cost to the beauty and cultural heritage of said planets. One report exclaimed how its natural wonders and places of renowned beauty had been destroyed, now used for quarrying of raw materials to build heavy fortifications. Other areas turned to intensive industrialization for warfare, and populations who were formerly skilled in the arts and glorification and worship of the Emperor of Man now were being retrained as frontline infantry. Some hive worlds have even resisted the mass mobilization of its citizenry and attempts to fulfill recruitment quotas have left hive cities facing massive population riots that were barely able to be contained by enforcement. Also notably, rogue traders have been able to leverage individuals' desires to escape the horror in exchange for lucrative profits, acting under the guise of delivering official material to destinations outside of the cordon. With the scale of operations being deployed, individual rogue traders with questionable morals are easily able to slip in and out of subsectors. The strategy of Inquisitor Nasir has left many citizens of Warden Planets openly questioning the fact that in order to save their world, they had also now destroyed what made it worthwhile saving in the first place. Despite their best laid plans, it was clear from the outset that the struggle within the cordon surrounding Octarius was going to be challenging. Inquisitor Sassan was not a singular unchallenged voice in how to tackle the spiralling Octarius crisis, and even though he had managed to bring together a formidable and impressive plan that now surrounded the Empire of Octarius and its surrounding subsectors, it was becoming painfully clear just how thin their defences were stretched. Building up defensive worlds against the scale of Xenos threat they were facing does not happen overnight, and many high-ranking officials of the Imperium were already debating and discussing that the Xenos forces were expanding at such exponential rates that they may in fact be uncontainable. Thus a counter-argument began against Sahansan's vision of an impenetrable sphere of defence surrounding Octarius, 
Other inquisitors and imperial military leaders suggested that an immense and decisive strike should be used to shatter the momentum and weight of Xenos forces before such options were no longer even possible. Essentially a classic best defense is a good offense scenario, although considering the entire reason as to why Inquisitor Crippman decided it were necessary to redirect the Tyranid fleet Leviathan toward Octarius in the first place was that they were unable to be resisted by the Imperium seems that the suggestion that now suddenly they could throw enough human fodder at them as to make a dent at all seems somewhat illogical, not to mention the fact that the Tyranids were now being fuelled by the Orcs and the Orcs were revelling and hyped up by the unending battles slaughtering the tsunamis of horrifying bugs. So the prospect of throwing hundreds of thousands if not millions of Imperial Guard against such a wall of attrition seemed a forlorn hope, and an illogical wastage that further threatened to undermine the greater vision suggested by Nasir. Only compounding the issue was the heel-dragging speed of the Imperial deployment to warden worlds on the edge of the cordon. In the opening years of the plan to create an impenetrable cordon surrounding Octarius, many warden plants' capabilities were deemed to be well below levels determined necessary to withstand a major assault by either of the Xenos. In fact, it was generally determined to be less than half of what was required. They were far from even the minimal levels considered acceptable. It was a matter of not if, but when the designated cordon would be tested, and when that first test came, it was far more devastating than any could have anticipated. The affected area was in the subsector of Pancalis, where with little to no warning many of its systems were suddenly deluged by Xenos hordes. The level of defences of the planets within the subsector were widely ranging, with some having been moderately well fortified, others had barely anything to defend themselves with. Pancalis became almost overnight a crucible of intense warfare. Tyranid, Orc, Gene Stealer cults, chaos breaches occurring, and within the disruption, deployed Imperials such as Inquisition, Death Watch, Astartes chapters, Mechanicus forces bringing with them Night Houses and Titanicus Legios. Pancalis was burning white hot with the fires of war, and to rub salt into the wound for the Imperium, reports came of Drakari raiding and emptying cities while the eyes of the Imperium's defences were elsewhere. Despite the volume of forces being directed toward the subsector by the Imperium, worlds were already falling, the Kernak system being one of the first threatened by major Orc forces under the leadership of one Nabrot Stubfingers, who incidentally if I ever make an Orc force I think needs to definitely be one of my characters as the name Stubfingers is just too comical. These Orcs were of the Blood Axis clan, an intriguing Orc faction as they curiously sometimes have been known to fight not against but with the Imperium when situations merited. Even having traded with the Imperium, they also use more stealthy practices than most other Orcs and they take the effort to consider the bare bones of what might be called strategies. They will even retreat from battle if they consider the situation to be unsuitable. And while many orcs may eventually run from battle if the tides turn heavily against them to come back later for another go, the Blood Axes are more likely to do so with a true sense of awareness as to when it may be tactically advantageous. With their unusual behaviour, it's no wonder other orcs tend to look upon them as stupid and not particularly orky. Most of all, they're seen as untrustworthy given their past interactions with Daumis. Still, regardless of any past affiliations that may have occurred, none of this was taking place in the Kernak system, and Stubfingers quickly bested the Imperium by fooling them into thinking captured ships were still under the Imperium's control, thereby using them as weapons, crashing the ships into defensive Mechanica stations to the glee and humour of the Orcs, who thought the entire situation was hilarious. This was of course followed on by Stubfingers' major armada of ships, which lay waste to Kernak 3 and 4. This initial testing of the cordon, well before it was truly ready, led to night houses being annihilated, heavily defended penal worlds also were overwhelmed as a deluge of orcs assaulted, numbering in what was estimated to be billions. Despite even Titanicus forces being present, this steady attrition of Imperial hardware as it's turned against them meant that it was only a matter of time before a tipping point came and the Imperials were no longer able to mount any kind of defence. The weight of orc firepower outmatched Imperial production capability, and millions were left to die amid hasty evacuations. With the slim hope of escaping to elsewhere in the system, they may try to mount a counter-offensive. Elsewhere within the Pancalis subsector, there were Tyranid incursions, often upon worlds 
already struggling to contend with gene stealer cultist uprisings and now having perfectly executed their design as agents of disorder the all enveloping shadow of the high fleet would arrive to scour planets prepared by the insidious cultists who found themselves twisted into believing their true masters were these horrifying xenos I've already discussed at length the process by which planets are undermined by gene stealer cults, as well as the kind of miserable conclusion planets infected by these types of Xenos agents can expect, so see Tyranids Part 2 for more on that, which follows link to the end of this video. Suffice to say, worlds within the subsector, now swamped by swaths of Tyranid, were now hopelessly lost. In predictable fashion, the Xenos horrors would descend first via their blanket of warp disturbance blocking all communications, then a systematic invasion from orbit using bioforms dropped from the skies. All attempts at defence by this stage for any world other than heavily defended Imperial Bastion planets like an Astartes Chapter Homeworld or Forge World are going to be token gestures at best. So inevitably, for the worlds of systems in the sector, they would be steadily consumed. Gigantic tunnelling horrors, large enough to devour entire city structures, rampage through the surface of planets, eating rock and organic matter alike. While elsewhere population centres were subjected to almost endless bioform bombardment, bioexplosive mines or others that burst forth ravenous acid-spitting creatures, all amid air, now heavily saturated with tyranid spores, some Imperial fortresses managed to hold for a time as the organic forms broke upon their thick ferrocrete walls like an ocean upon mighty rocks. Yet the Tyranids are no stranger to such bastions, and when all other resources fail, they will utilise their immensely powerful psychic forms, such as the Zoanthrope and Neurothrope, to literally crumble reality and implode void shields surrounding Imperial fortresses. Upon the worlds they fell upon, this is precisely what occurred. And this is one of the factors making the Tyranid Xenos so truly terrifying to the forces of humanity, is that whoever they descend upon, all those who lie beneath the skies looking up as they fill with spores and bioform deployment mechanisms, know that at the back of their minds as much as they might attempt to maintain that spark of human driving force, that desire to survive, their hope in survival, a gnawing voice in the back of their mind will remind them that even their best efforts will likely prove to be futile. Few if any worlds are capable of surviving a Tyranid deluge, least of all those cut off from any and all external support. There do still remain, of course, those rare instances where combinations of gritted bloody teeth, initiative and tactical prowess allow humanity to drag themselves through the inevitable horror to the rare success of victory on the other side. One might question how a system of low populated, strictly devout Imperials were able to weather the storm of the Xenos, yet within the system of Bayanzir's Hollow, this is precisely what occurred. Just how is another matter entirely. Because despite their skillful efforts to defeat the enemy, one might wonder if their religious devotion played a part in their ability to evade total destruction, which on the face of things had seemed inevitable, as it would be across countless worlds assaulted by Xenos. Did the Emperor reach out here and single out these worlds for his protection? Especially considering the relative tactical significance of the system. The defenders of the few planets without the system would undoubtedly tell you yes, for they lived in harsh conditions with minimal means to defend themselves. Upon the mining world of Saint's Blessing, the populations largely retreated underground to the vast network of tunnels and mining operations, using explosives to cave in around baited Tyranid swarms, which sometimes stopped them, or other times the Xenos simply skirted around and assaulted from new directions to devour the defenders. This process of painfully intensive attrition ground on for many months. On another of the system's worlds named Holy Toil, they similarly would use the skills and land they knew to crush the Xenos, baiting and triggering vast landslides to crush their enemy, using the landscape to their advantage. Carefully planned kill zones and environmental traps were enough to hold back the Tyranid menace, but they were relentless, and casualties were high. It was only with the aid of Astardi's death watch in combination with the expert knowledge of the limited population that the peoples of Bayanzir's Hollow were able to turn the tide, and only through the combination of bitter determination to survive no matter the cost and precise scheme tactics delivered maximum damage using minimal firepower plus the combined aid and knowledge of specialist Astartes trained to exterminate such as Xenos would allow the human workers of these small worlds to emerge as the victors. It's impossible to say if a world once contaminated by alien horrors can never be considered truly cleansed, as often they reappear decades, centuries and even millennia down the line. But for now they had held the line, and a small victory for the Imperium was still a victory, and enough to lift the spirits of many. 
Yet where one system that seemed doomed from the outset survived despite everything being seemingly against it, elsewhere the strongest systems and planets struggled to keep their heads above water when they suffered truly catastrophic devastation, being assaulted both internally and externally simultaneously. This is what occurred within the Kosolst Anvil system, a system featuring heavy defences, many industrial worlds producing armament, and hive worlds with populations so vast as to be near enough limitless. They considered themselves to be powerful enough to weather anything that the alien horrors could throw at them, yet soon enough they would be painfully humbled. As noted previously, the cults of the Tyranids are one of the most powerful weapons in their destabilization of Imperial planets, hollowing them out from the inside, insidiously corrupting power from within, and enabling Tyranid assaults when they eventually arrive to sometimes occur with only the most minimal levels of resistance. Gene stealer cults can seed themselves over generations, and changes occur so gradually that populations are barely able to notice it happening. Then before they're able to prevent it, the entire leadership structures of worlds have been completely undermined, and when the most desperate of moments arrives on the horizon, strong leadership is nowhere to be found, and then the mass slaughter begins. This though was not their only problem. With such vast populations upon their hive worlds, and such massive levels of industry, these are the breeding grounds of the disaffected the jealous, the power-hungry, and so the system of Kosolst's anvil found itself facing both cults worshipping the dark beings of the warp, as well as those worshipping the Xenos. Then the orcs arrived, closely followed by a Tyranid fleet. The timing could not have been worse, and what followed were the inevitable consequences. The Imperials had on their side the benefit of strong discipline among those troops who were not contaminated, and thankfully the leadership of the system worlds were also not significantly compromised, enabling the defenders to allow the Tyranid, Orcs and Cultists to largely fight among themselves, thus allowing the humans to generally pick their battles and only engage with weakened Xenos forces or when it was necessary to constrain their advance. As successful as such disciplined strategies were, it still led to deaths in the millions, and this was despite immense support from the likes of Super Heavy Ultramar Auxiliae. Where ordinarily such massive firepower and heavy defences would have proved considerably formidable and would hold a better than average chance of withstanding a main Xenos assault, the disruption within was making things far more challenging for the Imperials. Sabotage, constant small-scale insurrections, these were headaches the leadership could well do without and also they had to ensure that forces were assigned to deal with such matters. This was a considerable frustration because these are forces that could have been used in fighting the far more pressing main assaults. Thankfully though, as the war raged, such small-scale cults were swept up by massive conscription or skillful eradication by enforcers. This enabled a more focused effort in defence by the Imperials. Still, wherever there were battles to be had, lines to be held, the cost was extortionate. The Imperium's forces were holding the line within the Pankala subsector, but barely. Inquisitor Sahansan was acutely aware that at this early stage, defeat here would doom the entire Cordon project before it had truly begun. In the eventuality of either the Orcs or Tyranids successfully breaking clean through the Imperial defensive line, this would then enable them to connect with new forces outside in the case of the Orcs or for the Tyranids to secure biomass that would begin fielding a new campaign of destruction, devouring worlds even deeper into the Imperium. Either of these eventualities was considered wholly unacceptable and were to be prevented by any means necessary. However, something being deemed unacceptable by Imperial officials and being literally preventable were two entirely different things. The necessary forces to bolster an already below strength cordon were not readily forthcoming in neighbouring sectors and systems. Additionally, many had already been stripped nearly bare of defences and options were becoming increasingly limited for Inquisitor Sahansan. Consequently, the entire validity of the cordon impenetra operation was looking increasingly precarious. Despite the Inquisition giving the impression of its full and united authority in the name of the Emperor, we know it of course to be anything but. Across the Imperium many systems and sectors will likely know only the control of specific factions of the Inquisition, perhaps the Thorians or mono-dominant philosophies, for there are in fact a wide-ranging plethora of philosophical outlooks by those within the Inquisition, such as the Amalathians, who believe that the Emperor has an all-seeing grand plan and that therefore whatever is currently occurring within humanity is unfolding exactly as it should, or by contrast, it could be the extremely heretical followers of Xanthism who believe in using and turning the powers of chaos against it, be these artifacts, weapons or god machines that are possessed, demon hosts and any other dark arcane methodology. 
Given the wide-reaching divide between inquisitorial ideologies, it's no surprise that there are those who might offer dissenting opinions on how to handle the situation within Octarius. In fact, the entire situation was starting to descend into a finger-pointing contest, with each accusing the others of being as much like Inquisitor Crippman or worse. As mentioned earlier, there are those who believe that Inquisitor Sahasan's grand operation to surround and seal in the Xenos within Octarius was doomed to failure and a completely wasted effort. One such inquisitor being Athacles van Roth, who described Nasir as suffering from Cryptman madness. Except that he himself then posited that the only way to acceptably deal with the Arctorius problem was by launching a campaign to neutralise the Xenos threat. Individuals other than myself might dare to suggest that there was an air of hypocrisy in such framing of other inquisitors, but to themselves suggest far more insane solutions. Van Roth's grand hope came in the form of a bizarre Xenos artifact, that being a strange crown of an orc boss which seemingly disrupted the synaptic connections that are vital for Tyranid forms to function with any coherency, thereby making them unable to mount any solid resistance against Imperial forces. They could then be slaughtered with ease. Van Roth saw the opportunity for such a piece of Xenos tech to unlock the key to turn the tide of not just Octarius, but all future warfare for the Imperium against Tyranids, and potentially enable them to at last put up a real ability to deal with these Xenos horrors. This procurement was only possible though thanks to the Death Watch, with whom Van Roth was acquainted. In order for this Xenos tech to be of any use at all though, they would have to be able to both reproduce its abilities and then also replicate it as a device, perhaps with some adaptation for use as a weapon. The only means for them to test this would be to try it out with live subjects, and so Van Roth would travel to the world of Veloria, an Eldar maiden world now contaminated by Xenos. In cooperation with a Xeno savant explorer, Barcelia Mung, Van Roth would test out the crown upon subjects both human and orc in collaboration with the Death Watch and various other Imperial forces, both regular Minotaurum and biologist techs. Despite all their best efforts, much like other orc technology, it only appeared functional when they mounted upon orc mechs. To make matters worse, they received notice that both orc ships and space hulks were barreling toward the planet. They presumed attracted somehow by this orc crown, but it was anyone's guess as to why. Van Roth would collaborate with a lost Inquisitor, Moore, who had long been abandoned on this planet when she was caught attempting to steal a transport and flee the world. Upon explanation of his grand quest, Muir laughed maniacally that he and Kripman and Sahasan were all as foolish as one another and this would all end in their doom. She also revealed that Van Roth, who had planned to destroy the remains of an Eldar ship in order to cover their escape, their plan would be unworkable unless he allied with stranded Eldari she knew on the world. This they would do as fighting between orcs and the world and Tyranids continued unabated and enabled them to carry out various plans so that they might all extricate themselves. Their attempts would be ultimately futile though, and after having encountered Tyranids within the Eldar structures, Van Roth would manage to escape outside with only minimal survivors. They discovered to their horror that the Death Watch escorting the Crown were as doomed as they themselves. The entire planet was now completely deluged by orcs, seemingly attracted to the world by the strange Xenos crown in saturation levels. The Imperial mission was completely doomed, and Van Roth's last sights would be that of Imperial cruisers burning up upon entering the atmosphere of Veloria. It had long been my assumption that the Octarius War would be focused somehow on a far grander Orc perspective, with the Imperium providing background for far smaller operations. It's hard to tell anything from the Tyranid perspective, because as we know, all they are are driven instinct. Although, wouldn't it be interesting to try and write something from the Tyranid perspective? Perhaps along the same lines as Lalian Paul's The Bees, well worth a read by the way, or if not that then as I had expected something more from the Orc Lads Crumpib perspective. I mean, it shouldn't shock me I suppose because 40k is generally framed from the Imperial perspective always and so therefore is this. It was also Inquisitor Crippman's grand plan from the outset and this is merely the continuation of it. Still, even then, I had thought we would see perhaps a few focused chapters of Astartes, some Imperial Guard perhaps spearheaded by the Death Corps of Krieg, not commitments uncommon for Imperial sector-based operations. Clearly things are not being handled on the small scale here. It's a containment of the entirety of the Octarius Orc Empire and beyond. Just in the first operations, we have listings of many thousands of Imperial Guard regiments, Three attending core Astartes chapters of Dark Krakens, a Salamander successor, 
Atlantean Spears, Blood Angel successors, and the Obsidian Jaguars, an Ultramarine successor, as well as potentially 20 others in smaller Strike Force operations, including members of the Dark Angels, Ultramarines, White Scars, and Red Scorpions. And then you still have Inquisition, Sororitas, Mechanicus, Night Houses bringing anything over a thousand knights total. Then the Mechanicus also have deployed at least four Titan Legio. And then still we have the Imperial Navy assets. It is quite clear then that Octarius, in terms of what it's dragging into the maw of its war, is turning out to be quite all encompassing for the Imperium. Which raised a question for me if we consider just how heavy this whole operation is becoming. Are we getting enough gritty detail about the campaign and those who are orchestrating it? And to answer that, I need to briefly step out of the lore itself. Because for anyone who has read a significant amount of 40k supplementary material, you tend to get a feel, albeit subjectively, for what can be handled lightweight and what deserves to be handled more heavily. Octarius, for my cup of tea, deserves to be handled more heavily. I want to see it have more of a weighty background. The degree of storytelling you get from the Imperial Armor series, the Heresy Forge World books, or quite honestly, even the more recent Vigilus stuff. Octarius deserves to be fleshed out to fulfill that weight of material, and granted there are more books in the series to come, and it's certainly not as thin as the Psychic Awakening series, which deserved to be heavier than it was, considering the importance in some of its subject matter. Now, I've talked about supplements before. The Titanicus, Necromunda books are worth getting just for themselves, even if you weren't playing the game, because if you're a 40k fan, they contain rich sources of material, interesting lore. But supplement books are not novels. They are essentially mission packs or rule expansions, and therefore most often only have a thin section with which they expand upon a narrative. Then it's data, missions, force traits, strats, etc. But whereas novels are character driven, supplement material tends to cut the waffle and get down to the core sequence of events and actions. This is standard for campaign and supplement material, and importantly they often cover events which do not appear in novels, or they enable the framing of lore concepts that do not appear elsewhere. But this can often lead to confusion, and it's why when people ask me where can I read about such and such, I have to say well you can't, that's out of print, and no digital version is available. This is why I own most supplementary series, and this is why my Gathering Storm set, which only appeared recently again for people digitally, I doubt it's going to be reprinted, and so it remains safely on my bookshelves. So Octarius then, is it weighty enough? For me, no. But if you stack it up objectively against other supplements across the past three years, it does just about enough. Barely. Also, supplements are not always consistent in their length across a series, so I'm hopeful that additional books will contain heftier explorations of Octorius, and this is really more of an opening overview to set the scene. Returning to the Inquisitors on Octorius itself, it's clear that things are far from being in an ideal situation. Multiple Inquisitors thought that Sansun was doomed from the start, and things so far are definitely leaning in that direction. Where though are the Krieg? Where are the vast Tyranid and Orc waves smashing against one another, with lengthy descriptions of rising Orc war bosses ready to bash in some heads? These are the things we need, so I'm hopeful we will see them as the series unfolds. Additionally, my original considerations were that perhaps nearby Imperial forces would be drawn into the conflict, Kadashan for example, so far there's little to speak of in that regard, we seem only to be having the very initial overviews of the situation, the Inquisition placing their pieces on the board, as it were. And already there have been multiple fatalities, Inquisitor Van Roth's mission was truly laudable, if not obviously a fool's errand. The very idea of an Imperium member being able to devise the functionality of an Orc device just shows how little the humans of the Imperium understand of the galaxy and how much hubris they themselves carry. The annihilation of this operation though leaves questions unanswered, like what is the fate of the Tyranid Synapse disrupting crown? The prospect that if the Orcs retained control of this, they may well be able to use it to gain the upper hand on the Tyranids, which while in one respect may be positive for the Imperium, as we well know the prospect of either Xenos emerging from Octarius victorious was not at all the plan. Even more interesting though, is that dotted through the Octarius material, there are skimmed brief references of a communication with Inquisitor Cripman himself. Seemingly, Cripman still has agents at work within the Imperium and in relation to Octarius, which raises some very interesting possibilities for the future. Will Inquisitor Sahansun be able to hold back the tsunami of Xenos, and can the Cordon Impenetra become as its name suggests? What of Cripman? What of Krieg? And what of the Xenos themselves? 
The final fate of the Octarius Sector is far from certain, and the lives of many billions of Imperial citizens and massive quantities of assets still hang in a precarious balance. So let's talk about my next selection for Audible. For the last months of 2021, I decided it would be good to give everyone time to work through a trilogy during the holiday period where people often have some downtime. I completed recently the updated Dark Imperium, Plague, War and Goblight series and this is our selection through to the end of the year. These also connect with many of our ongoing topics of consideration that surround the nature of Chaos and the Emperor of Man, plus the future of the Imperium and how it may need to be handled. Also, this series is good for both beginners and those experienced with the 40k verse, and once we reach the new year I'll plan to tackle this trilogy through future videos. There's a whole variety of twists and turns across the three audiobooks, and the story encompasses a plethora of topics, many different individual perspectives are presented, so there is for good or bad a large amount of discussion to be had, and the Heresy series still always remains the bedrock story of the Imperium, but overall the Dark Imperium trilogy has a lot to offer, and is valuable in understanding just where things stand for humanity in the Imperium of 40k, and of course it also sows seeds that will bear fruit down the line in future revelations and the story of the Imperium. Remember, if you're new to all this, you can get involved today, plus the bonus for a limited time, saving 46% on your first four months of Audible. On top of that, you'll get full access to the Plus catalog, filled with thousands of audiobooks, originals and much more. All are included with your membership, so you can download and stream all you want. And within the Plus selection, credits are not needed. Try it today by visiting audible.com slash Luton, and again for those in the US, text Luton to 500-500. As always, I'll finish by saying a huge thanks to all of you for supporting me here on the channel, and I'll see you all in the next one.